Today I want to talk about artificial life, something that I worked on for uh, a lot of years and it, it sort of underlies a lot of the research I've done more recently. This is another New Mexico CS for All video for the class we're doing on computational thinking and programming. Uh, all right, uh, that very idea of artificial life is, is kind of a weird because we normally think of life as, as natural. Uh, nature is full of life. Uh, uh, but we need to come up with a definition broad enough so that we can see other kinds of things as being life or life-like. And in fact, that's the distinction that we'll talk about uh, immediately after. The weak claim is that the, these systems are merely lifelike. The strong claim is that these systems are actually life. Whether it actually makes a concrete difference in any particular system is unclear, but it does make a difference in our expectations. We'll take a look at some demos and then try to wrap up as quick as we can. This is my big area, so I like to talk about it. Uh, uh, the, the meaning of life. Not just a movie by Monty Python. Uh, here's a dictionary definition. The state of being which begins with generation, birth, or germination, ends with death. Anything that happens in the middle. Uh, um, this is sort of a catch-all. It's, it's not completely satisfying. It's a description of what happens during a life rather than some sort of necessary and sufficient conditions for what it means for anything to be a life. Uh, um, many people have taken cracks at uh, coming up with such a definition. Here's two. A self-sustaining chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. A self-organized non-equilibrium system such that its process is governed by a program stored symbolically and can reproduce itself. Now, both of these talk about systems. They both talk about them doing something on their own, sustaining, organizing. They have slightly different emphases. Uh, uh, Gerald Joyce is a chemist, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, uh, Lee Smolin is a physicist. Uh, um, when I, as a computer person, uh, see program and particularly see things like symbolically, uh, those are little red flags to me. That's a, there's a lot of stuff that has to be explained when someone invokes program symbolic representations and so on. Uh, I want to boil it away and make it as simple as I possibly can. My favorite definition. Uh, um, now, I got this from my dad. The internet seems to think that this is maybe from Doctor Who. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, if anybody actually has any references to this in print, I'd be interested to see a citation. Uh, um, the key point of this is the preservation, preserving. So a big umbrella definition. Life is a system that dynamically preserves pattern. Okay. Now you might think you'd be able to preserve a pattern without being dynamic about it, like Mount Rushmore. You know, you just make it big and you make it out of rock, and then the pattern will persist. The pattern will be preserved. But in fact, even the mountains come down eventually, and it turns out Mount Rushmore. Every fall, the National Park Service gets out there and, and repairs it. You know, plasters up Lincoln's nose or, or whatever it is what they do. So the larger system of Mount Rushmore plus people are dynamically preserving that pattern, but the lifelike part of it is really the people more than the Mount Rushmore. Okay, so this is clearly extremely general, and we're going to have to admit that there might be uh, some things that aren't really as lifelike as other things. I mean, even a little eddy whirlpool in a stream uh, that, you know, if you moved one pebble, it would disappear. It has a dynamically preserved pattern. The water flows by and you see it. It lasts for some period of time. That's going to have a little bit of life according to this view, according to this definition. So this fundamentally is sort of computational paganism. Wherever you look out in the world, if you see a pattern being dynamically preserved, that is a little bit of life. That is a system that's a little lifelike. And then it's a spectrum. Okay, This is plenty of room for what we need. Okay, So now we can build computers, computer programs, whatever, that will display this kind of property, that will dynamically preserve their pattern. What are those 
uh, computer systems that we build, well, that depends on the stance that we want to take to them. We could take the weak claim and say that this computational system is a model of some living system. And when we do that, uh, uh, our goal is to understand something about life or understand something about whatever system we're claiming it's a model of. And ideally, we'd like to be able to make predictions about whatever it is that it's a model of. Okay, let's take a look at an example. All right, here is a model of the world, everything. Uh, um, it's been running for a while here, day 2400 and something. Uh, uh, what it is is a uh, 100 by 100 grid uh, uh, with mountains uh, uh, all around it that nothing can get through. Uh, um, and spaces inside that can hold things. Uh, you may see these little uh, flashes every so often. Uh, those are, I'm imagining, lightning bolts. Uh, any given time step, any given square has some probability of just zapping whatever is there. And that's our model of stuff happening. That whatever else goes on in a system, if it's going to be a realistic model at all, it's got to have some process of tearing down, decay, time passing, okay? So let's dynamically preserve our pattern. Well, let's take a straw man first here. Okay, this guy, he's now sitting in one of these squares, and all of these little creatures that I've implemented, the way they work is they look at when it's their turn to go, we're scattering the turns around into every square in random order and then doing it again. Uh, when this it's this guy's turn to go, he looks at one random spot in his neighborhood and does something about it. Uh, uh, maybe he moves there, maybe he destroys and eats whatever's there, maybe he has an offspring, whatever we want to do. This particular guy does nothing. Okay, when it's his turn, he just says, I'm done. All right, and he's preserving his pattern fine, right? But we know that sooner or later the odds are going to catch up with him. And it's doing pretty well. Uh, um, yeah. But he's the only <clears throat> instance of the guy. So down here we have the list, uh, the amount of time that we've got, the total number of living things. We're calling this guy a living. He, I call him type S because he just stands there. He's the standing guy. Uh, um, well, we'll even let him live. But sooner or later he's going to get zapped by lightning and then he's gone. <clears throat> So how do we fight against that? We fight against that by reproduction. We fight against that by building a system that can make copies of itself. So here is such a thing. Uh, um, this is a little green square. is like a plant that just grows under the influence of sunlight or some resource that's generally available. And it goes from one to two. Now it's four. Well, one of them got zapped. Uh, uh, it would have gone for, oh, we lost our standing guy. Okay. Uh, um, he wasn't very satisfying anyway. He was Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore just got, uh, um, you know, lightning hit it. On the other hand, it's very, very, very unlikely at this point that uh, enough lightning is going to hit all of these little uh, type P plant guys uh, to wipe them out. They're pattern is being preserved by copying and that's the basic living trick we start out with one guy then we had two then we had four and it's often used as an example let's uh let this speed up a little uh, um of an exponential growth process one times two is four uh, times two is two times two is four and so on uh, um it's worth noting that this growth process that we're watching right here uh, time 3800, 3900, 4000 coming up. This is not actually growing exponentially. Why not? Well, because very quickly the plants are not limited by their ability to reproduce. The way I program these guys, they can reproduce fast. 
they're limited by the ability to find empty space to put an offspring in. These guys never actually move. When they wake up, they look at one of the randomly picked neighbors, and if it's empty and if they have enough energy, they split. They give some to, they create a new plant in that position, and then they reduce their size by somewhat more than what they gave. All right, let this go even faster. Uh, uh, all right, and the, and what we end up with is this, you know, ocean full of plants. Uh, that are occasionally zapped uh, by lightning and that creates an empty spot and then one of the neighbors fills it in it regrows and so on okay uh, um, the basic pattern preservation idea of life it's about amplification it's about reproduction and it's doing great uh, um, obviously we could have other things uh, show up in this world uh, uh, like in particular a herbivore whoa uh, um, uh, uh, so what happened there we sort of missed it it was so quick uh, um, the herbivores when they get a chance to move they look at a random square if it's empty they move into it if it's occupied by a plant they eat it if they have enough energy they might create an offspring where they used to be uh, um, and that's basically it. So they just sort of move around randomly, and if they happen to have a plant next to them, they try to eat it. Um, and what happened? Well, we had an absolute explosion in the population of these, uh, oh, and now they're extinct, the herbivores, the H's. Uh, um, they're gone. So if we let this speed up, uh, the plants regenerate themselves. And now, if we look at the classical mathematics governing uh, predators, in this case, uh, uh, the prey is the plant and the predator is the herbivores. Like if the plants had lookouts, they'd be go, you know, look out, here come the vegetarians. Uh, um, in the classical mathematics of it, the continuous mathematics of it, it's not possible for anything to actually go extinct. So the, the herbivores would become very small in number. That would allow the plants to rebound, and then there'd be plenty of food. So the herbivores would reproduce uh, and, and eat them up. Here, of course, there's always that possibility of the last guy dies. And in fact, that's what happened here. Let's, let's try it again. We'll stick in a... Uh, herbivore and he eats he reproduces they reproduce 200 300 400 uh, uh, reproducing very rapidly and basically a plague on the land just sweeping across it eating everything and once again they have all starved to death now uh, you can we actually if we can get lucked out let's see what happens here uh, um, we will get a system which, uh, this might do it. Yeah, I think, well, yeah, I think this might do it. Uh, um, if we can get a system where there's enough small patches of plants uh, that have a few of the herbivores sort of scattered around in them, then in fact we can get to a rather stable uh, circumstance, and, and this, this will do it. Uh, let's go to full speed here. Uh, um, all right. Uh, uh, so the herbivores are chasing around after the plants. The plants are getting eaten, but then the herbivores are having famines and starving. Plants are regrowing. This is quite stable for uh, as long as I've been watching it, as I've been setting, setting up this video. It's only a small piece of what we would normally consider a living system. If the standing guy wasn't very realistic because he just sat there and tried to preserve one single pattern flawlessly, the limitation here is that whenever the plant uh, reproduces itself, its offspring is always absolutely identical, down to the every last teeny bit of behavior and every possible parameter. Same thing with the herbivores. Uh, uh, the copying process is absolutely faithful. Uh, uh, let's take a look at another example. All right. Um, so we've got our stuff happening again. Let's put in an, one of these evolutionary plants. 
which you can't really see there. The idea here is this plant has some genetic information that tells it one, two, tells him what kind of color he wants to be. All right, so this is sort of a pale blue green. Uh, uh, and now we're going through the exponential growth phase one, two, four, uh, uh, which will quickly give way to a, a quadratic growth phase in this case because our world is two dimensional. So the periphery uh, only grows that fast. But the difference here is that every time we, uh, one of these plants has an offspring, the offspring's color, either its, its hue or how intense it is, um, uh, may shift slightly. Okay, and you, can, you may already be able to see that off on one side here, uh, the color is a little different. If we let it speed up, it should become more apparent. Yeah, so now we're sort of getting some blue-purple stuff, and we're getting some sort of greener-yellow stuff, and it's kind of starting to look like a clown wig uh, or something like that. Now, why are these colors changing? They're just changing because of drift, because it, the only way that these plants move is by having offspring. The offspring have little mutations, so the further we get from the center where we started the guy, with the more generations down uh, in terms of the plant lineage that we are. All right, we've got a, a evolving herbivore. Let's get one of him going. Um, and the idea with him is, whoops, uh, he has uh, a particular color that he'd most like to eat. So the, the main color of his face, this guy would you know sort of like to eat a sort of light uh, cream color. So the, the, the food that's around him, the plants that are around him, not his favorite food, that means he has a let, when he tries to interact with one and tries to eat it, he won't succeed as often. That's the way I've made this work. That when you get a good color match, yum, you chump it down. When it's a bad match, you're more likely to just not be able to swallow it and you don't get any energy that day. Um, but once again, when you have a kid, the kid's preference for what color and what amount of saturation, how intense the color, slightly modified compared to yours. Okay? And these guys are starting to uh, reproduce and spread a little bit. Uh, um, let's speed this up. Uh, uh, all right. What's going on here? The 200 to 50, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're spreading. Now, unlike the original herbivores, which just ate everything, these guys are more selective. It seems like with them here anyway, they kind of like the greenish stuff, uh, and they're sort of leaving the bluer, purpler stuff behind. Uh, uh, and as a result, the green stuff is starting to disappear from the world, and the blue and purpler stuff is filling in the empty space left behind. Uh, um, we now have an evolutionary system where the plants are evolving under the pressure of the herbivores and the herbivores in turn are evolving under the pressure of the food sources provided by the uh, plants. Okay, so what's going to happen in the long run here? Maybe, uh, maybe we should let this cook for a while and talk about some other stuff and then come back and see what's happened here. All right, so was that model, all right, is it a model of a living system? If so, what living system is it a model of? It, it, was, that, was that green stuff supposed to be algae or these little white dots, they're snails? It was not actually a model of any specific system. And one of the terrible problems uh, with you, the weak claim of artificial life is that it's really hard to make a specific accurate model of an actual living system because actual living systems are so sort of gnarly they kind of depend on all sorts of different things and because they have that amplification step because they have that reproductive step with uh, a system that has amplification small differences at one time become big differences later on they can become big differences and as a result the small details of the living system may in fact make a big difference how the system works over time. Uh, 
So, to make an accurate artificial life model of any natural system, a specific species interaction, what have you, is very challenging. There's a lot of parameters that have to be set. I mean, you know, how fast do these plants grow? How fast do they gain energy? How When do they try to split? How much energy do they give to the offspring? I just sort of made up parameter values for all of that stuff in order to make a demo that showed some effect. So coming up with predictability is a challenge. But on the other hand, if you sort of back up a little bit and say, well, I'm not trying to model algae or any specific living system in the natural world. I'm just seeking to understand how living systems act in general, according across many different systems. They act a lot like this. Uh, they have uh, reproduction with amplification and so on. Uh, um, okay. Well, if we're not talking about the weak claim that this is a computer program, which is just a model, as we've been talking about all through this class, then the alternative is making the strong claim. The strong claim is that a computational system can be, literally be, uh, a living system, and that we need to bend the definition of living system and or computational system until that can actually be true. The difference between taking the strong claim and the weak claim, again, is a matter of emphasis. Uh, uh, with the strong claim, we don't necessarily care about modeling any particular system. It's the difference between trying to model uh, flight by making uh, bird wings and modeling flight by making jet engines and aluminum wings. Uh, uh, with the strong claim uh, for artificial life, the focus is just on building systems that actually do something uh, that potentially is useful, or at least useful to somebody. So do we have examples of this? Artificial systems that are out in the world doing work, that are reproducing, maybe, you know? Well, here's one example. This is data from 2001, it's kind of old now, from uh, UCSD, uh, showing the infections of the code red computer virus. And we can watch it over time. Uh, um, at, at midnight, there was a few hundred. Uh, uh, by noon, well, by 6, 7 a.m., there's thousands. By the afternoon, there's tens of thousands. By the evening, there's hundreds of thousands all over the globe. What we end up with, essentially, is a map of Microsoft software usage as of 2001 on the entire globe. This will go around one more time. So unlike the demo that we looked at first, the little world in a box, this it's confined to being inside computers, yes, but it's all over the planet. And since then, there have been many other sorts of these things uh, out in the wild, getting transmitted by internet or floppy disks or uh, picture frames, all sorts of things, USB keys. Uh, um, and they actually do stuff. They may do stuff just to computers. The Stuxnet virus last year did stuff in the physical world. It caused physical machines to wobble and destroy themselves. How real do you need it to be before you say, well, that thing went out, it worked its way through communication channels, reproducing itself, found its target, and destroyed stuff in the actual world. So I think there's some pretty strong basis for the strong claim that computational systems can be living systems. Since I think I am a computational system, I need the strong claim. You do too. All right. Uh, let's check back. Oh, whoa. What has happened here? Uh, um, well, the blue stuff has sort of gotten eaten up. Uh, um, uh, and look at this now. We've got these uh, red guys in the red patch. We've got some 
uh, blue guys down here uh, um, and all kinds of things oh there's some green guys down here there'll be some well okay all right so so it, it looks like what's happening now is uh, yellow plants seem to be kind of spreading out of the uh, uh, southeast uh, because there isn't anybody who's really eating them uh, but we know what will happen soon enough uh, um, the it looked like they were red guys here uh, um, uh, they're already getting lighter up here uh, um, so where we used to have sort of big solid blue monoculture of one type now we've got uh, lots of little patches of quite different colors near each other um, and what looks like a endlessly churning, but if you step back, kind of stable ecology. Okay, so let's mop it up. If we take the strong claim that uh, com computational systems can be living systems, uh, um, these days we can start, and well, there's a new area called living technology which is focused specifically on the strong claim. It's saying we can build living systems that are lifelike in some way. We can build them out of hardware, that's like robots and stuff like that. We can build them purely out of software. It's the kind of stuff that we just saw here. We can build them out of wetware, that sort of carbon-based chemistry, water solvents, the stuff that we are made of. And hopefully, uh, uh, we can do something useful with them uh, for society. Uh, it, it drives me crazy that if you look at artificial living systems today, uh, uh, the example of uh, strong, the strong claim of A-Life that I picked uh, is, is a bad one. It's, it's one that is uh, tearing stuff down. Uh, uh, the Code Red virus, Stuxnet. It's difficult, not, not impossible, but it's difficult to find really decent examples of using reproducing systems for good, uh, for, the, for the overall benefit of society. And I think that's got to change. And so my current research area is focused on how can we re-engineer computing, how can we rethink computing to take advantage of more of these lifelike principles. And, oh, and so now it looks like the plants are cycling back towards white to some degree. Uh, um, I mean, you know, the important point, well, there's a lot of important points, but one important point about life is like what Woody Allen said, you know, 90% of success is just showing up. Life fills space wherever there's enough resources to support it, and that means it can be there when the extraordinary event just happens to happen somewhere. And Okay. Uh, uh, that's it. Thanks for watching.